Last week, we, toward the end of our study, got into the first part of chapter 2 of our study of the book of Revelation. And we know that chapter 2, as well as chapter 3, deals with the letters that were addressed to the seven churches that were mentioned in chapter 1, of which we had the symbolism described of the angels referring to the uh, to the stars, rather, referring to the angels of the seven churches, and the lampstands or the candlesticks that represented the seven churches. So we talked about how that though we did not read all both chapters to read all of the letters at one time, that there are things that are in common uh, with every single letter that was written. And we talked about this a little bit in our study uh, last Wednesday. We see that there truly is a pattern that's followed in each of these letters. There is the greeting made initially to the church that the letter is being addressed to. We see in those letters that Christ identifies himself in each and every one of the letters. If in that particular letter the church needed commending, then we see that being done. If the church needed to be condemned, we see that being done in all seven of these letters. And then in all seven, we find what holds true is warnings that Christ gives, as well as encouragement, exhortation for the churches and the things that they need to be doing. And in all seven letters, we see there is the promise of the reward to those who overcome. And then, of course, at the very end, there was the invitation to he to hath the ears to hear, let him hear. So there are seven things that are the same as far as making sure that they're an integral part of each one of these seven letters. And so we see that in the similarities to each one of these letters, it is unto the angel of the church that these letters are addressed. And then we talked about how the, the statement was made, I know your works. And we looked at Hebrews 4, verse 13, how that truly seeing that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, let us hold fast the profession. A profession, and we know what a profession is. It is a career. It is a a work that we engage in, and we need, we all the time think of professions from the standpoint of worldly things of this world and careers, but I think maybe we don't think about it enough from the standpoint of really, if we are a Christian, that is our profession, that is our work, that is our career. So let us hold fast our profession, and in all of the things that we do, make sure that they're in harmony with God's word. We looked at Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, where that whatever a man sows is what he reaps, and we need not to be deceived. That is a universal fact of the matter. Whatever we sow, we reap. And so we see that we need to certainly be concerned because God knows even our works as an individual, as well as otherwise. And then we look to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 that reminds us that there's a day of accounting coming, a day in which we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account of the deeds that we've done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. We ended our study last week that the statement in each of these letters to him who overcomes. And we see that word overcome found some 17 times in the book of Revelation. So truly, it is a book to encourage Christians to whatever the obstacle, whatever the persecution, whatever the tribulation, whatever it might be, don't let it overcome you. You overcome it. So certainly there have been numerous times that we see that word being used quite frequently. And then, of course, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says 
to the churches. I think we read verses 1 through 7, but since that's been a week ago, let's read them again real quickly. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and hast for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we see the first letter that is written is written to the church at Ephesus. And I guess to sort of summarize all of what's said in this letter in just a simple single statement, we could say that of the church at Ephesus, the honeymoon is over. Because the thing that we always have that stands out in our minds about the church at Ephesus from this letter is the fact that they had left their first love. As far as Ephesus is concerned, the city itself, it sometimes helps to understand the situation of Christians that have lived in that city if we understand what was the circumstances, what was the environment that they were living in. Ephesus was a major seaport and it is the commercial or was the commercial gateway to Asia. In fact we find that Paul worked with the church here in its beginnings from about the year 54 to 57 AD and all we have to do is go back to the book of Acts and see and read chapters 18 and 19 to see the particulars of what Paul confronted and what Paul dealt with. Remember that there was the silversmith and that in, provoke, uh, on the, in casting out the demon of the girl that had the spirit of divination, then this brought the whole city against Paul and Silas and anyone else that was against him. And we find that they worshiped the goddess Diana and hopefully you will remember that. If not, go back and read those two chapters in the book of Acts. So we see and reminded of the city of Ephesus being primarily a idolatrous city. And we find that he wrote, of course, a letter, the book of Ephesians, to the church there in Ephesus at about 62 A.D., we see that in that letter, at that time that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, the church had a reputation for being filled with love for the Lord and for fellow saints. So that sort of stands in a sharp contrast, what we see in the letter to the Ephesians in that book, and then the letter that we're reading here in Revelation chapter 2. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> uh, Brother um, Sid, do you feel like reading? <laughs> Read verses 15 and 16. Therefore also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, you do not... 
All right? So here very early in the letter, he says, I've heard of your faith in the Lord and your love for all of the saints. Then we find in the third chapter, these words in verses 17 through 19, Brother White. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. All right. So here he says that we to have Christ, they're to have Christ dwell in their hearts by faith and be rooted and grounded in love to be able to comprehend with all of the saints what was the breadth, length, depth, and height of God's grace, God's love, and God's mercy. And then in chapter 6 of Ephesians in verse 24, Philip, read that for us. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. All right. So grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see then, as we've said, the church concerning this letter that the book contains had a reputation for being filled with love for the Lord. But we see that seemingly by the time that John writes the book of Revelation, what we've read here in these seven verses is, again, the Ephesians have left their first love. And I think this is one of the strong evidences for the later date of the writing of the book of Revelation. The one thing that maybe we need to spend a little time on, although it's not a whole lot of time that we can spend on it for the very simple reason we just don't have much information. And that is the statement that was made in verse 6, that thou hast hated, that thou, that this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That word Nicolaitans occurs only here in this sixth verse. And it occurs again in the 15th verse in the letter to Pergamos. However, there is no information that's given as to what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was, nor is there any information concerning what that doctrine allowed for. In other words, what the doctrine encouraged as far as practice when it comes to the doctrines of, the, of what it taught. There have been some who have supposed it was the same doctrine that was taught by Balaam. And we're going to be talking about the doctrine of Balaam because that also appears in these letters. But the doctrine of the Nicolaitans has been the first one that has made, made an appearance. But just let it, for the, for the moment, suffice to say that there are those who believe that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam is pretty much one and the same thing. And really, whether that's right, uh, whether that's right or not, it's an opinion. And that's where we have to leave it, as an opinion. We can speculate all we want to, but we'll still end up being not back where we started from. We have no real indication as to exactly what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans uh, amounted to. What we do know is that Paul, nor any of the other writers of the New Testament, never made mention of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. As I said, here in Revelation 2, verse 6 and verse 15, are the only two times in the New Testament that it's referred to. And again, this could also be taken as internal evidence for the fact of the later date when it comes to the writing of the book. But there's some early historic <coughs> excuse me. There's some early historians and 
we call them sometimes church leaders, church fathers, I mean. Iranians, for example, and there were others who stated that the name was derived from Nicholas, who was one of the seven who were chosen in Acts chapter 6. If you go back there to Acts 6, those seven men that were selected and appointed to do the work of seeing to it that the widows were not neglected in the daily ministration, certainly one of those individuals was named Nicholas. And so they are of the opinion that he fell away. Get caught up. Yeah, that was the opinion that he fell away and he became the founder of this religious sect. And his followers assumed his name in order to give him the credit for the doctrine. And certainly we know that is not at all out of what we see all down through history. But again, neither of these opinions can be found or based on any real solid evidence. But yet still, that's, that's one of the opinions about who the Nicolaitans are. A second opinion was from a, a Dutch Protestant commentator who lived in the 17th century and I hope I pronounce his name right, Vertringa. And he, along with a lot of other commentators since his time, have supposed that this name, Nicolaitans, was intended to be symbolical. And they base that on the fact that it's not designed to designate any sect of the people, but to describe those that resembled Balaam and that this word is used in the same manner as we'll read later on in Revelation 2 and verse 20, Jezebel, which we know Jezebel could obviously not be living at the time that the New Testament was being written. So that's why they're saying that the name Nicolaitans may very well be symbolic, like the name Jezebel is symbolic. But he went ahead, too, and he supposed that just taking the word Nicolaitans, he takes it and breaks it down in the Greek, where that the first part of the word means victory, and the other part of the word means people. And so he says it corresponds with the name of Balaam, because to take the name of Balaam, it is Lord of the people. And also, another rendering of Balaam's name is he destroyed the people. So they're saying that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam had the same effect in that it produced, their doctrines produced those things that led the people to commit fornication and to join, engage in idolatrous worship. And so they say that they can be referred to either as Balaamites or Nicol uh, Nickelodeonites. And all of that, they say, simply means the corrupter of the people. That's what Balaam did, and that's what they say that uh, Nic Nicolaitans did. They corrupted, they destroyed, they led the people into committing all kinds of things contrary to God's will. That's the second opinion. And the third opinion is, well, let's, let's, let's consider this in reference to this opinion. Let's consider a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> there is every reason to believe that the word here, Nicolaitans, refers to a class of people who wore that name and who were well known in the church at Ephesus and in the church at Pergamos, the two places where the name is used. And the other thing is that in Revelation 2 and verse 15, we see a definite 
distinction being made between the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Here we open in chapter 2 anyway. Go down and, and look at what we see in verse 15. We'll jump ahead of ourselves a little bit, but just for the sake of, the, of understanding the word. He says in verse, let's look at verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So here's clearly the doctrine of Balaam stated. Now, look at what we have in verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So there's a clear distinction between the fact that these are not the same. The doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans are not the same. The, the overall end result will maybe be the corrupting of the people, obviously. But the specific manner the, may not be the same. So I'm a little uh, not inclined to go along with the fact that, that many people want to have that the Nicolaitans and, and those of Balaam were teaching and practicing one and the same thing because it clearly seems to be a very distinct separation being made here in this letter to the church at Pergamos. And that third, we said there was three opinions. The third opinion is that some person now unknown, probably with the name Nicholas or Nicolaus, was their leader and led the foundation or laid the foundation of the sect similar to those men that were mentioned by Gamaliel. You remember when the apostles Peter and John were brought before the Jewish council? You remember that they was about to cast them into prison, they were threatening to kill them, and it was Gamaliel that stood up and said, you know, maybe we need to hold off here. You know, you remember Thetis. He had over 400 followers. And, and that just piddled out. He, he died and, and his followers were scattered. And then there was this Judas of Galilee who led a revolt. And, you know, Camille is saying... Look what happened. They're, they're no longer here. The cause is no longer a major factor. So Gamaliel's advice was leave, leave the apostles alone. Because if we put these men to death, we may be fighting against God. But let's leave them alone and see what the outcome is. So will we not fight against God. Everybody remember that one in Acts 5? So that's what I'm saying, that concerning this third opinion. Of all of the opinions, this may be the most likely one. At least it's the one that I'm more inclined to go along with. But again, like we said, it's, it's an opinion. We don't know for sure. But what the usual thing to occur when a new doctrine is formulated is for it to bear the name of the person who originated it. And we know that's true all down through history in the religions of the world, how the doctrines have come, and usually those doctrines, even churches, have been named after the person that advocated, that promoted what particular doctrine or a particular belief. So those are the three. Again, I thought I would just throw them out there because they may help or may not, and I really don't, like I said, think that there's any real conclusive way that we can know exactly what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans 
where did they get the name and, and all of that, except we know that it existed and the churches at Ephesus and the church at Pergamos was having problems dealing with it. And Jesus addresses them to be careful and to deal with it properly because it was something that he hated. So obviously, whatever the doctrine, it was a false doctrine. Whatever it was, it was the doctrine that was leading people away from the truth. Whatever the particulars of it might have been. And the particulars is really what we don't know about, other than just to speculate. Any, any comments? All right, when we look at the city of Ephesus, Ephesus was an economic stronghold in Asia. It was a principal city. It was considered the supreme metropolis of Asia. So that's the influence, that's the power that the city of Ephesus had in just a social economic standpoint. And that, as we said, this is where Christians have obeyed the gospel and they are living. In fact, some scholars estimate that the number of people that are living in Ephesus when Paul visited in 54 AD to be over a quarter of a million people. And that's a sizable number of people to think about a city 2,000 years ago. Of course, we have cities now that are in the millions, but we're 2,000 years later. And there's good historical evidence that John lived and taught in Ephesus in his later years. But again, this is historical evidence. We have no Bible evidence to indicate that. But when you put Ephesus in the setting of the other six churches of Asia, here's where we see Ephesus being located. Again, they're on the Aegean Sea making them a city, certainly for trade from the sea. Most of the goods was, of course, in that day and time, because of the relative ease of ocean-going vessels, rather than over land, any city that was located on a good seaport was a city that was likely to be very economically uh, well-to-do. Talking about how big the city is, these are some pictures that Brother Klein took. And what we see here is a, you know, we would call that a, a stadium in, in our day and time. <coughs> but here's a stadium that over 10,000 people could be seated. Of course, we have stadiums that, that are 10, times that, but still we see a city as to what Ephesus was. And there was another thing about Ephesus in as far as its location. Not only was it a seaport, but it was three miles from the Aegean Sea in the Castor River Valley. It was a great seaport, but the harbor often filled with silt. But in addition to the seaport, in addition to the seaport, there was major roads that intersected at Ephesus. And we know that when we look on our maps today and we see cities that are large, if we go back into history, it was because they were where roads of trade intersected. And a, a town grew up, a city grew up. And so not only did Ephesus have a seaport to bolster its economic situation, but it had these roads that also affected it. Here is a picture of the Flavian Temple. This was, uh, Flavian was not a single, a single ruler of Rome. It was sort of a family of rulers that, that ruled the Roman Empire from about, I think it was 69 to about 96 AD. Of these Flavian rulers, there was Vespasian, 
we've heard that name. There was Titus, we have heard that name. And then there was Dominican. These were the three rulers that made up the Flavian dynasty. And this is what's left over of the temple that was erected to that dynasty. Here's a picture of the Agora, and the Agora is just simply a marketplace. This is where a major part of the economics, the selling and the buying that went on in the city took place. And this is just the ruins of what it looks like today. And remember we said when we study back in Acts 18 and 19, concerning Paul's going to Ephesus, that there was the Temple of Diana. It was also called the Temple of Artemis. But Diana and the temple that was erected to her, what we see here is certainly nothing to compare, but at the time, it was known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Temple of Artemis or Diana, the Romans called her Diana. The, the Greeks, the Asians called her Artemis. And it was located uh, by the sea. What we see here is that the temple was about 2,200, uh, 220 feet wide, about 106 columns that made up the temple. It was not covered but the walls surrounded the open court area inside of which there was a temple out building containing the statue of Diana or Artemis, as the case might be. So certainly we remember Ephesus from, from that aspect of Diana and the things that transpired that are recorded for us in the book of Acts. So let's look at some lessons to be learned from this church here at Ephesus. One lesson that can be learned is that a church with sound doctrine is to be commended, most certainly. In 1 John 4 and verse 1, uh, they'll read that for us. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. And then, of course, we have Paul writing to the church at Galatia, the very familiar verses in verses 6 through 8. Donnie, read that for us. I marvel that you are so suddenly moved from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there will be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel. But though we are an angel from heaven, preaching of the gospel unto you, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. All right. So we know that we are commanded over and over in the New Testament to not succumb to false teachers. The ravenous wolves, Jesus described them in his Sermon on the Mount. Paul described them in the letter to Corinth as being just like the devil. He's a master of disguise. Well, so are the false teachers. They don't appear as false teachers. So they're cunning, they're crafty. They are not easily to be distinguished from just the physical aspects of the person, whether it's personality or uh, looks or that thing. But they have to be carefully scrutinized concerning the things that they teach and the lives that they live. So we're commanded to not believe every spirit but try them. The church at Galatia was, was being warned so, what's the word? They were, they were being warned, Paul was so concerned of their condition and the, the direction it was going, that I marvel it was so soon removed. So it doesn't take long for the effects of false teaching 
to make its appearance and affect the thinking and the lives of the people that are willing to give heed to it. So certainly a lesson here concerning Calvin is that he says, I know thy works and thy labor, verse 2, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them that are evil, and that thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. So truly the church at Ephesus was doing a good job as far as making sure of the things that were being taught and practiced were the things of God's word. They weren't being fooled by those that, and of course, obviously all through the, the New Testament, we know that there was always those that were trying to make themselves out to be apostles. And if they were not trying to make themselves out to be apostles, they were trying to do like what some of those in the church at Corinth was doing, and that was to try to discredit the apostles. So all of this was going on in the first century. So it appears from this second verse that Ephesus was being commended for the things that they were doing. You have borne, you have patience, and for my name's sake you have labored and have not fainted. And that's, that's easy to do in having to constantly be on guard. There's a tendency to let up. There's a tendency to, to take a break. <laughs> but that's, again, like we've always said, the devil is an opportunist. He will seize those moments that we are less attentive, that we're not being, as Peter says, being sober and being vigilant because our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. But truly, these things are all commendable, but there's still a problem at Ephesus. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. So the lesson we see here, first bell, is that a church without zeal is fruitless. 1 Corinthians 13, first three verses. Chain, read those for us. Don't speak with the tongues of men and the vain over them, and have not charity. I am become the sounding brass of the human symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, but I can move mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So truly, Ephesus is to be commended. But they've left their first love. And what are they admonished to do? They're admonished to remember. That is what we see in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. The next thing that they're admonished is to repent. Repent. And then he says, do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. So he says, as we've already talked about, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. So again, another good aspect of the church at Ephesus. They were obviously standing their ground against false doctrine, false teaching, false apostles. And I really, I really don't think we can even begin to imagine what all that that involves. That, that is major battle. That is major effort and work to battle false teachers, false doctrine, those trying to parade themselves as apostles, and those that are, that are espousing this, whatever the idea was of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But in all of those things, the church at Ephesus was, was great, was fine. But to what degree that they were leaving their first love, it's really hard to determine, except to the fact that 
whatever it takes to motivate is so important in all of these struggles that we have. If we lose a sense of what motivates us, and that may be what this first love is, to motivate us because of what? Because of what God has done for us, because of his grace, because of his mercy, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because of what Jesus was willing to do. It's, it's sometimes easy to forget all of that in the affairs of the world and even within the affairs of the church when we're dealing with people. So it's easy in that sense to lose our first love if that's indeed what the first love has reference to here. But still, we need to be sure that we don't lose what it's all about. And really that's what Paul was saying to the Corinthians. What all we do and everything that we do do, if it's not with the right motive, what does it profit? It's nothing. So all of what the Ephesians were doing was great. But if it was not with the proper motivation, if what was causing them to do these things was not for the love that they needed to have, whether for God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, his word, all of these things, then they truly need to repent, and do the first works. Go back and realize what it's all about. What is it all for? What is the purpose? You know, I think that's something that we as Christians, if we're not careful, we must never lose sight of our purpose. Our purpose is so important and that we don't need to lose sight of it. What's my purpose of being a Christian? What am I being a Christian for? Is it all just for a home in heaven or is it to please God, to be a better servant? So purpose in what we do is, is so important. And that's what we must never lose as a Christian. We need to keep coming back to what is my purpose? What's my purpose for being in this world? What's my purpose for being a Christian? What's my purpose for being a member of the church here at East Albertville? What's my purpose? Am I fulfilling my purpose? Any, any comments before our time is up? All right, Lord willing, we'll pick up with verse 8 and the second letter to the church at Simona for our study next week. Yeah? Do what? Okay, absolutely, right. That's a good word. Right, urgent. And we need...